So, so hi everyone, I'm Matthew Villar Miranda. I work in curatorial at ASU Art Museum. I am a current student at ASU in art history. I'm coming to you live from my studio apartment in Mesa, Arizona. And foremostly, I wanted to wish health and safety to your family and communities. And thank you for taking time out of your lunch. Feel, feel free to munch and learn or converse. <laughs> and it's wonderful to see all your faces or imagine them in my case. So welcome to the Digital ASU Art Museum. If the museum were open, we would be in the galleries in front of the artwork, having a free-flowing conversation, engaging and deep looking. And in the absence of this, I have the unique privilege of hosting you in the digital realm. So for the first 30 minutes, I will give a close reading of Girl on Sofa 1925, and something that feels to me um, not usually, not usual of my academic writing, but sort of like an unfinished rumination or some ongoing reflections. And lastly, I'm gonna talk through some images in the later years of Kuniyoshi's life, um, which is characterized by the violence and racism and trauma that Japanese Americans face directly following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, and at that point, we can um, open up the discussion. So as a disclaimer, there's gonna be modernist nudity and uh, graphic imagery from wartime posters. Um, and I want to start on this image, which I absolutely adore, which is Yasuo Kuniyoshi um, reclining on the same sofa, this like floral um, printed piece of furniture that's also in the painting, um, which brings me like art historical joy, <laughs> if even just a, a trivial point out. But um, there's something really interesting about imagining Yasuo, even though he's a straight identified um, Japanese born man who immigrated to the United States at the age of 16 alone without his family as uh, that girl on the sofa. So um, Yasuo Kuniyoshi's Girl on Sofa, painted in 1925, was the, among the original 17 foundational works in the ASU Art Museum permanent collection gifted by Oliver B. James, or OBJ as we call him. After his career in law in New York, he retired in Phoenix, Arizona, and in 1951, he gifted a suite of works from early American regionalism, like Edward Hopper's House by a Road, and Giorgio O'Keeffe's first skull painting, Crowd Favorites, which is currently installed in the Art and Focus Gallery, where you will be able to see them in person, and hopefully soon and in time. But Girl on Sofa is a hot commodity not only for his quotation of old masters like the reclining female of Orientalist past and the all-important collapse of still life and the figural in one painting, but this particular painting was part of a series of recreational women bathers, uh, circus girls, and strong women, painted in the mid-1920s when Kuniyoshi was ascending the art academic ranks, and by this time he had moved from Los Angeles to New York and began working at the Legendary Art Student League, um, and he was among a cabal of elite American modernists, which um, you can see by the image, is a particular demographic, white and male. But Kunio, she was relatively unknown in Japan um, until his resurgence of scholarly interest in the 1980s, prompting the dealer Michael Owen to tempt ASU Art Museum into deaccessioning the work for the prospective price of $1,500,000. But the price didn't satisfy its cultural value. And it's this cultural value that I try to ascertain from the letters and correspondences and the object files in the museum archives. So in the memo from the founder of the Arizona State Collection of American Art in 1950, OBJ wrote, Kuniyoshi's first paintings were willed with the naive, humorous interest in people and things found in Bruegel. And these paintings of oriental fantasy and the Eastern concept of perspective were blended with modernism. He went on to give a brief retrospective of Kuniyoshi. In 1922, children became the subject of these paintings. And then in 1924, oh, and in the corner here is just a little snippet from Bruegel's um, childhood games, just to see the visual parallels, um, perhaps what OBJ was saying when he was writing this memo. Um, but in 1924, Women in the Sea, then thereafter, there's still life and landscapes were added. And then finally, he sums up the signature Kuniyoshi cultural value, which is 
voluptuousness has been the strongest quality in these paintings of women. So in review, in his statement, I read oriental fantasy, naive things, and voluptuousness. And here my academic conditioning was on high alert and I read othering, infantilizing, exoticizing. And after reading this passage, I had to recognize the ways in which the, yeah, yes, the, the language reflects the 1940s, but I thought that I should do my due diligence in trying to think about the possible and productive problematizations that these terms can reveal. And this language resonated with the popular criticism of the time that praised Kuniyoshi as avant-garde in an Eastern way or tastefully suggestive without really pinning down these mysterious quote Asian but cultural valuable qualities. And to me, when I look at this, there is nothing I can read and grow on a sofa in the tradition of Japanese art. Oil painting was not widely practiced in 20th century Japan. Kuniyoshi's subjects are historically European or American and the vernacularism or down to earthness signaled nearly nothing about the legacy of ink based paintings, of watercolors or wood blocks or landscapes of which Japan is known for in the 19th century. Um, and then I noticed the pears at the foreground and the ogre table is dramatically tipped upward forming a rhomboid backdrop that presses up three miraculously erect pears, keeping their balance despite the extreme surface angle and the perfect product placement of the pack of camels with a single jutting cigarette piercing through the paper packaging. The voluptuous woman confidently tucks her left forearm, seems to have tousled her red chemise, revealing a non-nip slip, and her broad full thighs clasping for balance as she teeters on the skewed chaise sofa. But this presentation of a woman's body and an equivalent rhetorical register at the consumer objects of matches and cigarettes and the ripened pears placed for the delectation of the presumably male gaze summoned for me a phantom of the 19th century. Um, that would be Marxist commodity fetishism. And I'm not gonna get too crazy about it. I don't want to be like, here we go again. <laughs> but, um, but the attempt of pairs at the table is toppling edge, especially drew my eye. They stood like shadows of another triad of French modernity. And that is Cezanne's three pairs in the collection of the National Gallery which had famously toured in the 1920 Venice Biennale, um, so around the time of uh, Kuniyoshi's ascent. Um, and there's a professor that I had an undergrad named TJ Clark, and he loved um, applying Marxism to Cezanne. And he is a professor of considerable legacy in my undergrad career and um, noted that the fruits, especially in Cezanne's world, marked a telling turn to the world of things. And so from quoting Marx, I remember he noted the moment he grappled with this new readily available realm of stuff. And Clark, quoting Marx, says, um, commodities come into the world in the shape of use values, articles or goods, such as iron, linen, corn, to which I will add cigarettes, pairs, and matches. But this is their plane, their homely and bodily form, end quote. Now, T.J. Clark, in his own words, says, Two things connected to my mind with Cezanne's vision, his sense of the new world, the object world that has taken way. And one, Marx happens on a spatial and sexual metaphor. And two, how these things take on a new reality for us. The object world all converges into a single stuff, an Einheit or a one thing. Um, so with that, the supple single thing, the single form, the repetitions and the interlockings of these modular parts start to emerge in the organization of the volumes of the voluptuous woman, the tapered curvatures, of the thigh and the bottom rounding to the thick segments of her wrapped arms, the swell of the exposed breasts and the collapsed use form, um, the body form, pear body, pear fruit, and an ever narrowing commodity realm uncomfortably reveals Kuniyoshi's orders of desire, the erotic shaping of his object world. Marx continues in Capital, a commodity appears at first sight, a very trivial thing and easily understood. Its analysis shows that it is in reality a very queer thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So that didn't feel very good. I don't like to disintegrate a figure into abstraction like that. Um, 
objectification of bodies for consumption with the sheen of half big Marxism is one, um, patriarchal, and two, not feasible as a model of equity. But it does, however, describe the ways in which Kuniyoshi's eroticization neatly complies into a modernist language. And perhaps that also explains his success. Or in other words, as a Japanese aspiring to be an American, his successful assimilation. Um, so who is she? So in a statement to Ms. Rosamond Rost of Art News, who inquired about the specificity of his women, Kuniyoshi returned the, the following response. Um, it's the idea of a woman that I like to paint, a woman to represent all women, and seems of greater value to me to paint my conception of a woman, to express my inner feelings towards the object, is more important than the physical aspects of any individual. This is also what I believe when painting other matters too. I use certain types of models because she represents certain elements and characteristics compounded of a way of thinking and a physical outline that appeal and help to formulate my ideas. Whatever experiences I have had during my lifetimes are woven into my ideals of women. I have never painted a portrait of any particular reason, Although sometimes it may look like the person, if so, it is purely accidental. But my intention is to paint a woman, regardless of class, who is sophisticated and worldly. And I have been consistent in the past of working in this trend. I maintain that my painting, I maintain that painting any object, that the importance and impact lie in the grasping of the content of the matter, the essence pulsating within itself. Instead of a painting from the outside in, my efforts have been to concentrate on the inside out. So um, I'm noticing in, this, in his own language, the voluptuous woman is not really a portrait of a specific person, but an ideal, a universal all woman, a model, a representation, a purity, an essence, a value, a queer thing, an object and yet I'm still uncomfortable. I cannot accept the equivalence of woman object. So I should expand the reading into the historical or not just objects as metaphysical niceties, but objects themselves as a trace of a world of social relations. And Kuniyoshi celebrated Cezanne and the early French modernists. In this lost painting, which now exists as a photograph, um, which displays Matisse's canonical woman with the hat, that has come to act as a poster child for the wild and illogical colors of the folk movement. But here, it's halfway covered with a thick cloth and her mouth is stifled with a necked bowl. Again, the pair seem to take special privilege over this object hierarchy. So in 1925, the year that that painting was painted, um, was also the year that Kuniyoshi and his wife, Catherine Schmidt, met, whom they met while they were students in New York, and they had planned to move permanently to Paris, where Kuniyoshi developed a rapport with the French-American expressionist, Jules Paskin, um, notorious for painting erotic women in thin, tousled slips, and familiarly, there's that one characteristic breast out, which explains to me um, Kuniyoshi's own inclusion of an exposed breast, the sort of homosocial or um, maybe a nod between each other. But um, both Paskin and Kuniyoshi were known to live in Catherine Schmidt's words, frustratingly bohemian wives in Paris, late nights of drinking and smoking that led to Catherine's decision to move back to the United States and the couple's eventual divorce in 1932. So, this kind of bohemian life brings my attention to yet another fetish object. Um, and it's one that bears a distinct humpbacked logo of Commodity America, it's the Camel Cigarettes. Unlike the three pairs, I will examine the box of cigarettes and the voluptuous women's relationships to the shifting gender processions of women in the early, in the early 20th century. So in review, oriental fantasy, naive things, and voluptuousness cigarettes. The All-American Cigarette, brand introduced by R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company in 1913, has featured since its creation an Arabian app, Camel, a beast of burden endemic to the Middle East and the Horn of Africa. And the 1914 advertisement from the North Bulletin reads, tomorrow, quote, there'll be more camels in this town than all in Asia and Africa combined. 
to add assets to imagine, the American cigarettes will soon spread and populate and outnumber and overran camels are in, in real life. Um, in 1920, in the Scientific American ad, the familiar silhouette of a camel stands in uh, an Egyptian landscape of palms and pyramids. The column praises its distinctive taste, quote, for instance, camels are delightfully mild. You can smoke them liberally. And then in italic and then quoted at the bottom there, yet that desirable body is all there. So that's where I got stuck, that desirable body, that intangible quality of smokers high, the nutty, toasted, rounded, full-bodied, inhaled and sucked, but not seen, the sensual commodity body, the commodity as an image. It is, in this case, the flattening of the orient to logos, slogans, types, graphics, which does not, which does little to hide the U.S.'s use of a mystical, feminized East as a framework for selling expansionist ideologies produce, sell, populate, American empire writ large. In 1928, Lucky Strike Cigarettes began its Torches of Freedom campaign, supposing the tobacco-filled pipettes were characteristic of another distinctly American attitude, liberty. And the ad reads, quote, an ancient prejudice has been removed and a star-spangled hand breaks the binding chains from the cigarette box and in doing so, releases the clatter of cigarettes upon the modestly dressed, chastely women sporting beach bonnets and head-to-toe dresses. And in 1928, pioneering aviatrix Amelia Earhart made her debut. Flight, fearlessness, and feminine independence achievable with a drag of tobacco. And cigarettes became fashion, as exemplified by the archetype of the decadent Gilded Age in a bell-shaped cloche hat, cigarette holder, elegantly modeled by the Marlboro 1924 flapper. So the burgeoning mar cigarette market would soon expand into the East, into China, and most notably um, with Hotman, which is one of the most widely popular brands. And every year they produce calendar posters, or perhaps with more frequency than that. But they're very, very collectible at this time, and I literally have one on my wall um, when I took a class in undergrad and I found one in a thrift store and, you, and I literally have the one on the left here um, hanging above me. <laughs> but the, the early calendar posters which broke with the traditional visual culture of China's scholarly past, the mountain landscapes, the calligraphy, the bird and flower gold walk paintings, began to feature a different self-assured kind of Chinese woman. She had short cropped hair, the cut off sleeves of her chi pao, wearing newly in vogue high heel shoes, and I'm framed by the art deco decor, the modeng or modern woman. So Kuniyoshi was likely unaware of the shifts in this kind of visual culture overseas. He only, he only um, visited Japan once um, since 1906 to visit his ailing father and admitted his own loss of touch with his country of origin. Kuniyoshi, however, did adopt the semantics of a newly minted, chain-smoking, self-possessed modern woman, a woman of volition expressed by the escalating commodification of the attitude of early 20th century feminism. Girl on Sofa is one prototype of a quickly globalizing image, and feminism was one's ability to choose and control her own object realm, her bodies, her consumer choices. However, something changed in the disposition of Kuniyoshi's women in the 1930s. Um, in Daily News, the image to the left, a Solan Burnett languidly clutches a newspaper, brutally staring, cigarettes pinned between her fingers, and a brown rimmed hat hangs in the background suggesting the absence of man. And at this time, um, Kuniyoshi was divorced to his first wife. And the subsequent paintings in these series often feature the similar dismal formula. A newspaper, blackened hues, downcast eyes, long gazes met with exhaustion and anxiety. And as Kuniyoshi paints this series, Hitler rises to power, Japan escalates conflict with China, and the world moves towards World War II. So remember, Kuniyoshi wrote, whatever experiences I have had during my lifetimes are woven into my ideals of women. 
And in the image to the left, somebody tore my poster in 1943. A smoky-eyed woman turns her steely gaze away as another woman in maroon tights and leotard tears a poster with hands lurching in the air bearing the truncated phrase, starvation. The poster was actually designed by a friend, Ben Sean, um, with the quote, we French workers mourn you. Defeat means slavery, starvation, and death. A warning to Americans following the German occupation of Vichy, um, Vichy France in 1942. Um, and in 1941, Kuniyoshi writes to his colleague, George Biddle, following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And he says in quotes, uh, quote, as you probably realize the world condition as it is today, in my particular case, produced a very awkward and trying situation. My short days have changed my status in this country, although I myself have not changed at all. So overnight his status changed from immigrant to enemy alien. And desperate to prove his loyalty to the US government, he accepted an invitation by the Office of War Information, the same office that produced this kind of graphic propaganda, Kuniyoshi insisted, in appearance I am oriental, but my beliefs, my ideals, and my sentiments have been shaped by living in the free American atmosphere most of my life at heart. I am an American and I see and I feel everything that way. So with that, the Office of War Information stipulated that artists illustrate a roster of things um, against the impending Japanese threat. Number one, the issue, what we are fighting for, why we fight. Then number two, the enemy, the nature of our adversary, whom we fight. And it goes on further. We need to describe the enemy more fully, what his intentions are, how he looks. We might suggest that you might care to work on the Japanese enemy. And then Kuniyoshi returned a reply, yes, I would like to work on the Japanese enemy. So these are the images he submitted. And I'm just gonna let a little bit of silence pass just because I feel like doing a formal analysis is a really heavy, serious task that might not be brunch material. <laughs> but, um, but there is an excellent art historian, um, Shi Peng, who um, does an excellent analysis of his wartime imagery. So our historian Shi Wang notes that all the faces are turned away. There are no particular racial markers, save for the use of flags and banners. And this omission is intentional as Kuniyoshi's way of retaining strategic ambivalence, oscillating between his American patriotism and his Japanese heritage. So only two of his drawings were accepted on the grounds that they did not fulfill stipulation number two, as detailed by the OWI which is that they did not describe the enemy more fully. These are the kinds of images that were accepted by the OWI. And in a 1941 issue of Life entitled, How to Tell Japs from the Chinese, it describes people from Japan as having a squat face, round brim glasses, squinty eyes, and grimacing buck teeth. This description stems from a caricature of General Hideki Tojo, the Prime Minister of Japan in 1941. And to the right, Kuniyoshi proudly paints his own caricature for the war effort of a squinting general grinning angrily. And it's this set of arbitrary qualities that was weaponized into blatantly racist propaganda that surely must have weighed heavily on Kuniyoshi's multiple and conflicting identities. And as I read the description, I can't help but to reflect on my own appearance as an Asian American, albeit Southeast Asian, Filipino American, and, um, and I imagine if such descriptions had been systematically used against me, how easy of a target I could be, and how now, at the present, the vampiric, deathly Tokyo kid, the bat wings on a Japanese demon carrying a warhead drawn nearly 78 years ago are returning stereotypes in a COVID-affected world. 
the rhetoric of yellow peril fueling increases in the rates of hate crimes against Asians and Americans today, where underlying patriotism is proven at the expense of the public health of among the U.S.'s most vulnerable communities. And Kuniyoshi only completed four self-portraits in his lifetime, and he's imaged here painting, but photographing, golfing, his identities of occupation. And I really wanted to pay attention to self-portraits because I thought that it might reveal something of the way that he's racializing himself or coming to accept his own ethnic or racial identity. But after 1941, um, all the Japanese descended Americans were required to file in the Alien Registration Division. And among weight and height and physical descriptions, identities of administration, a line reads that Kuniyoshi had spent 36 years in the US. He had spent them as a laborer, a student, a mentor, a leader of arts and advocacy and community groups. But due to the anti-Asian immigrant laws, like the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which prevented Chinese laborers from entering the US, Kuniyoshi came in 1906 and really found um, a small window of opportunity of immigration. And then the expansion of that law by 1924, which um, prevented the citizenship of people of, quote, other Asian nations. And then following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Kuniyoshi just never attained full American citizenship to his death day. So near the end of his life, his palate drastically shifted to acidic and neon washes, and instead of strong women and circus girls and plump babies, Kuniyoshi drew clowns, and he wrote, the grimness of reality is heightened by the color of unreality. In one of his last paintings, a pallid white mask covers a melancholic face. Masks supposedly protect, masks mark difference, masks cover identities. The title is, quote, I wear a mask today. And it's in that pronoun I that marks this sitter as Kuniyoshi's fifth and final portrait. From there, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and perhaps I could um, open up discussion or I can bring back any images that people wanted to look in detail. Um, or we can return to the home image, which is in the ASU permanent collection, the girl on sofa. No I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll I'll have a it's a pretty simple question. Um, how did your relationship with the piece in our collection at the museum change through all this? I think that um, so I for I work on my thesis on um, a Filipino American artist Alfonso Osorio, um, who's actually working around the same time, um, and through learning Kuniyoshi's story. Um, this complex negotiation of identity and how it plays out in your material production um, was really meaningful. And to kind of cross compare um, some of the things that Kuniyoshi did um, and some of the things that were playing on his mind were similar in Osorio's case. So um, for example, Osorio never really, although he was very brown and very Filipino, <laughs> he never really, um, painted racialized figures. Um, he always painted types, and they were blonde, beautiful, blue-eyed men. Um, and so for Kuniyoshi's depiction of women, he similarly has this desire to portray a type and a universal, and it's always in the space of whiteness. Um, so white women, and in Soryo's case, white men. <laughs> um, but, they, um, but I think that really says, like, I can just feel Kuniyoshi's desire to be an American and to assimilate. Um, and, you know, growing up, I similarly had that desire to, like, blend in. <laughs> so um, it kind of reveals to me how artists 
grapple with that desire to assimilate um, while also recognizing your identity or your heritage. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A question from Alec. Uh, hi, Matthew. I was wondering if like you have any sense of like the response to his oil paintings, for instance, like what was the, you know, what sort of response did he have at his time? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll share this so that we can look at the oil paintings. So it's really interesting because he painted in oil throughout his whole career, but in this time, um, they were actually widely uh, acclaimed. And in the 1920s, this kind of modernism was really in vogue. And um, it was not without its latent drippings of Orientalism. There's a lot of reviews that say um, that it's, it's modernity but Asian or modernity but Eastern. But the reviewers never really unpack that designation of Eastern. Um, so it's interesting that these paintings actually were very successful and that's the reason why this particular painting in the collection um, is very valuable and it's a symbol of the height of his career. But there's something about the drop now from his other oil paintings, which were the more sullen 1930s brooding smokers. And these didn't really recede in, in my research, which is very no, early. <laughs> but um, they didn't receive as good of a review. Um, they, I believe that there is just some, there's a psychological loadedness that just didn't really market or sell in wartime. Um, and that's the same for all his subsequent images um, and uh, leading up to his clown imagery, um, which is wax on canvas. They, they were, they're also not very successful in the market. And that's why he was somewhat um, obscured. Um, another reason is that by the time that he was producing this kind of oil painting um, in 1943 in America, abstract expressionism was really taking hold. It was like the hot new thing that shifted the art world from New York or from Paris to New York. And it was emblematic of the American ideal of freedom. And if you painted in figuration or in this kind of American regionalist modernist style by 1943 or 1950, you were seen as obsolete, or the market judged you as such. And so um, Kuniyoshi, you know, he, a lot of uh, accounts kind of tell of him dying disillusioned or disaffected, and it was a, a similarly a decline in the way that his paintings were so successful in the 30s, and then he was struggling to sell them now. Um, and then also the, just the, the total collapse of the, uh, of a Japanese American kind of identity around that time. But, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Amanda had a question, Matt, in the chat. She said, oh, yeah. can you show the images again that you asked us to pause on? Oh yeah, um, well that was kind of a free, I just was, you know, I just, um, we don't have to linger on <laughs> the more traumatic imagery, but, um, the ones that I wanted to pause on were the ones that were actually in the permanent collection. So I keep on losing myself. So the, there's two in the permanent collection. Um, and it's, it's a girl on sofa. And that's where I really wanted to give an extended uh, formal analysis, just to encourage that deep looking and just uh, to simulate the experience of uh, being in front of the painting and just taking your time and noticing the similarity in forms and the kinds of dialogue that's happening. But um, the other painting that is in the collection too um, is this, uh, this landscape, which was not very popular, but just, you know, like, a lot of us work at the museum who's on the call and just kind of think about like what's in our own backyard. Um, so this is a uh, Kuniyoshi entitled, I should have put the date, but this is made um, prior, uh, after 1930s and it has that really characteristic um, somber mood. Um, and this is a, a painting that hasn't been 
received a lot of hasn't received a lot of play. It hasn't been exhibited as much as the the girl on the sofa. So um, so I, I could return to girl on the sofa <laughs> and could think about things that just you know that pop out or things that um, that you know, weren't clearly addressed. Like for example, the matchbox. I have no idea what's going on with the matchbox, <laughs> but, or not. Matt, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I wonder um, for those of us. I'm not familiar with everyone in this chat, but could you give us um, a general step by step or general instructions on how to do a formal analysis? Uh, what do you mean when you you say oh, that yeah. for the viewer? <laughs> Yeah, so it's um, it's one of my favorite lessons I learned as an undergrad in art history, um, and I had this really charismatic teacher, um, Grimaldo Grisby, who who encouraged just like saying out loud where your eye is drawn and how it's drawn, why it's drawn there, what does it mean um, if you settle on an object, think deeply about that object. Um, so, um, so that's why, you know, I just, in that, in this kind of jazzy <laughs> abstraction, um, I really just was drawn to the way that this whole composition was organized by this really supple tapered pear shape. Um, and what does it mean when the pear is also the woman and the woman is the pear? Um, and why is it moving? Like it sweeps from the thighs over, it kind of has this kind of rhythm to it. Um, so um, there is a, there's a tendency to think, oh, like who is this woman? Who is this back, like what's her biographical background, her relationship to Kuniyoshi? Um, why do I feel like I should, you know, chop or, you know, crop out individual, individual sections of her? Um, but it made me feel like I could do this because after reading pers the personal writing to Kuniyoshi, he was really talking about a type and, principal elements and geometry and to me um it really informs the way that uh this kind of modernism in the early 20th century gained success it really was just blending of these pure abstract principles and finding pleasure uh, of looking so um it's a fun <laughs> exercise in that way With that, it's, um, I'm really happy to see some old faith from friends from LA <laughs> and some people I haven't seen in a long time. So even though um, we are in this digital realm, I feel like we're connecting. You know, it's such a cliche, but we are connecting in new ways. And um, this is really one of the few opportunities that um, some of my friends or family um, can see me do what I do. <laughs> like, I mean, like, they just talk about, you know, talk about art. <laughs> like, my mom, um, you know, I was destined to be a med student, so I would love to have a formal analysis or, like, an ekphrasis session with my mom at a museum and just sort of sit and think and, like, just see where our eyes are drawn, where the rhythm is going, what do we think about these thighs, you <laughs> know? Uh, so, um, but we never really do that, and it's just a difference of culture. We, I just, growing up, I never went to museums. It was always like a upper, I don't know, middle class thing, supposedly. So, um, so to hear, yeah, so to have like a different parts of my community come in at this, with this kind of, and see me exercise this kind of language is, is nice. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Do we have any other questions or comments or anything for Matt? Hey, Matt. So you've had, you have a strong strength in, you know, perspective and theory. And something I'm really curious about, you brought up COVID and parallels to contemporary realities and contemporary perspective shifts. How has COVID and some of these contemporary issues shaped some of your research or how you've understand these pieces or re-understood, you know, seminal pieces in your practice or in your research? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, COVID has really brought to light 
the precarity of my body and space. Um, so just like, I just wanted to push that metaphor of a mask, for example. It's really common in, um, in sort of Asian culture. This is Pan Asian now. <laughs> East Asian culture is to sort of wear a mask and it's not thought of as like you're, you're the sick Chinaman or the yellow peril. It's just protecting yourself from smog. <laughs> but the mask in Kuniyoshi's image, especially since this is somewhat of a death portrait um, or at the end of his life or near the end of his life, if you think about this really specific relationship that Asian bodies have with masks, and it does mark difference. It marks you as you go out into the world, and um, but not only in the you know the the pathological kind of way where you're the sick Chinaman, but also the um, Orientalist, like Middle Eastern, the mystique of the of a of a face covering. So I just thought that masks have a really specific relationship with. Um, with Asian bodies. And so when COVID broke out, um, of course, I, in the interest of public health, I would I wear a mask every time I go out to do essential activities, but it makes me a little bit scared, more or scared <laughs> on alert or like ready. Like um, I've just been, I've, there's a lot of great social media um, reporting sites and that when you see uh, an act of discrimination or a hate crime happen, in response to Asian people around COVID, um, people are encouraged to take an image and just send it to the database and then they'll keep an archive and there's scholars who work specifically um, on this kind of uh, presentation. But, um, but for me, like, I think looking at this image from 1942, following Pearl Harbor um, and the hysteria and the wartime, all this rhetoric about, you know, being a wartime, wartime president, wartime policy, defense production, um, and then just seeing like the the bat wings on this Japanese demon um, makes me think that oh this is a long lineage of um, of fear and a long lin lineage of uh, of like of just visual propagandistic rhetoric that informs the way um, this sick Chinaman or yellow peril comes to comes to be in the subconscious and so. I just look, looking at the right and it's really, you know, her fault to see, but it's still like, yeah, just the, the arbitrary connect linkages between um, bat wings and then, and then COVID and, um, and some of the ways that, that that same strategy, the deployment of uh, bats and demons and Asian bodies are used in some of the, in some of the images that I see um, around the social media space today. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> All right. Um, we are at 1250. So if there aren't any other burning questions, um, Matthew, do you want to share your contact info in case people come up with questions later on about your work or just want to connect? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. What would be the best way of doing that? <laughs> Um, just share it in the chat before we oh, okay. end. Yeah. I'll go ahead and do that now. I'm going to show my face. So yeah, thank you for all your work. And it was really interesting. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll have another one with Kevin on Thursday, same time. So we will see you there. And yeah, stay well, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, man. Uh, thanks. Nice to see you, Rob. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you, Mariah, too. <laughs> <laughs>